in part one, we talked about uh, uh, how, what is the winning coalition for universal care and how does business uh, fit into that? Uh, in part two, we'll be talking a little bit more about messaging and about how actually to create uh, the winning coalition between the, uh, what we described in part one as the three uh, partners to the winning coalition. Um, now I'll do just a little bit of review. Uh, in, in part one, we drew a, a normal bell curve and we said that we could kind of describe a healthy society uh, like this with most people kind of grouped together, uh, uh, sort of agreeing with each other and some people being uh, more toward the fringes. I've drawn on here the words liberal and conservative. Uh, I don't really like the words, uh, but they kind of help uh, describe uh, kind of the political environment. Um, onto that curve, I can draw the approximate location of progressives, uh, mainstream Democrats, and mainstream business uh, conservatives. Uh, historically, successful strategies for change have a way of looking like the winning target zone uh, depicted here. Uh, unsurprisingly, change often comes from the left side of the graph, but if the change is coming very, very far from the left, you lose the important mainstream crossover from the right. The sweet spot uh, requires that you have to give up a few progressives in order to draw significant support from some of the moderate right side of the graph, including some mainstream business conservatives and uh, some fiscal conservatives. Uh, this winning target zone um, is uh, in many ways uh, shows by Joe Biden's victory. Uh, it also shows uh, what will probably be the first state that uh, has a vote for, uh, uh, for universal care. This is what the winning target zone will likely look like for that. Now, some people say, oh, we don't have a, we don't have a normal bell curve. You know, we're not a healthy society. Uh, depending on whether you even agree with that's healthy. I, I think it's healthy to have a normal bell curve, but let's say that what we've really got is, is a complete separation, extreme uh, bimodality, um, so that we've got um, all of the uh, Biden voters on one side uh, and all of the, uh, the non-Biden voters on the, on the other side. Um, this kind of uh, shows a problem because uh, if, we, if we believe that all Biden voters are universal care supporters um, and, and all of them uh, and all universal care supporters are Biden voters, um, Joe Biden only got 51.3% of the vote. Uh, so it would take 98% of Biden voters uh, to pass universal care uh, under these conditions. And uh, I mean, just, I, I shouldn't say pass, just to get to 50-50. And that is not, 50-50 is not a good place to be. So we end up uh, looking not only for, and by the way that we know about 30% of Biden voters are not universal care uh, supporters. They support uh, more of the ACA or public option or, or some other way. So we're given the task of finding the progressive sort of wings of both the Biden voters and Trump voters. Uh, now I'm going to, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, part one, uh, in, we considered whether a coalition is possible based on uh, business people who we assume to be uh, kind of on the right side of the, of the curve um, and from Trump voters. Uh, the LA poll, uh, LA poll of Oregon voters from 2019 um, showed us a couple of interesting things. Um, uh, when given an opportunity to name the most critical problems of healthcare, business owners and self-employed are even more concerned about cost and complexity than other voters, equally concerned with other issues such as universal access um, 
and uh, trying to eliminate bankruptcy. So here, uh, business owners and self-employed uh, said 89% of them uh, said that cost was a major issue compared with only, only I say, 80% uh, in the general public. Uh, complexity, complexity the same with 79% um, saying it's a major problem compared to 69% of the, of the regular population uh, for a combination of reasons, including this cost and complexity, uh, they express business owners and self-employed expressed even less satisfaction with our system. Business owners and self-employed, by the way, are two and a half times as likely to be on Medicaid and twice as likely to be uninsured as the regular population. Um, voters um, and let's not skip over this in the poll, uh, business owners and self-employed polled 61% for universal care as described uh, as being um, publicly funded and run by a state agency. I mean, this is a lot of support. And by the way, it's fairly loyal support. Uh, whereas progressives actually started with a higher number at like uh, over 70%. As soon as you started talking about financing, um, progressives tended to run away and uh, business owners and self-employed uh, wanted to know more. Uh, in district, Oregon has, uh, uh, is partly rural red and partly um, uh, urban blue. Oregon has a red district that uh, voted uh, about two to one for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton and by a similar margin in 2020 favored Trump. And yet here they are uh, supporting universal care. Uh, in fact, uh, two to three times the entire state budget in order to that everyone can have hair, uh, can have uh, care. Um, and when you look at the individual districts, uh, you can see that uh, District 2, uh, the support was only just, which voted for Trump, uh, the support is only slightly lower than the districts which uh, voted, uh, which voted uh, for um, Hillary Clinton and for Joe Biden. Um, the, Polls showed strong differences in vocabulary. Progressives favor words like profit, greed, and insurance companies when asked, why does healthcare cost so much in the United States? Meanwhile, the words favored by business owners and self-employed were waste, utilization issues, and system inefficiencies. Uh, this is a very different uh, uh, palette of vocabulary uh, palette that they're painting their story lines from. So uh, you can see what happens if progressive use their words uh, to try to discuss the healthcare problem with business people. Um, you can understand that maybe they're not being uh, understood or, or not being related to. So now that we've finished our review, uh, we're going to uh, move on to part two if we want to create a winning coalition based on progressives, mainstream Democrats, and mainstream uh, business conservatives, how do we go about doing that? How do we recreate the messaging that will be inclusive to business people? Yeah, so what would it take? Progressive mainstream Democrats, mainstream business conservatives. Um, we, and we need to start, if you want to build a coalition, you need to uh, start that these groups are different and we need to respect them uh, for their legitimate differences. So how are these three groups uh, different? Uh, we'll have a breakout session in just a minute and discuss that. Uh, but I wanna add a, a second question. Uh, we have to not only uh, considering uh, besides respecting each group's differences, uh, we have to understand the current and historical relationships of these groups. Are they lifelong friends or are they set up 
uh, as traditional adversaries. So uh, here are two questions uh, that I want people to discuss. How are these three groups different? And what are the obstacles uh, to building a coalition? So um, we'll have a six minute breakout session uh, and each group uh, should select a spokesperson and um, come back and be prepared to talk about what you discussed in answer of these two questions. Oh, pictures of grandchildren. How did that get in here again? No. Rich, can you um, uh, share the comments from your group? Uh, yes, I, I think, uh, well, first we only got through question number one. And in different ways, we, I think we we're saying uh, much the same thing, uh, that people come to the table with uh, different narratives. As Warren has pointed out, they use different phrases, but it also means that their perspectives on life are different. They literally see life differently. Uh, an attorney that uh, spoke to a group in Colorado put it quite clearly. He said he had been studying jurists for 30 years trying to be able to pick and choose who would be favorable. And he came to the conclusion you're either wired as inclusive or exclusive. And that's the kind of language you're going to use. Uh, there was also a uh, reference to the fact that uh, from a perspective standpoint, if you're a business owner or manager, healthcare can be viewed as an expense because your world is around this business you're managing or owning. Whereas if you're an employee, perhaps, uh, healthcare is a need and someone else is responsible for going out and figuring out the details and buying it. Uh, so how you view that may be different from that perspective as well. Thank you. And Barbara, if you could unmute yourself, please. I wasn't told this, so I didn't take too many notes beforehand. But um, looking at the, the three different groups, uh, my feeling is that we see the system uh, um, differently. So conservatives are more of, of is a private, have a, a view that private, um, working through private groups, uh, whether that's charity, uh, nonprofits, where well, charities are nonprofits, um, would be the way to go. Progressives are much more for government. And that the middle of the road have both the progressive and the conservative in, inside of them. Um, so uh, in terms of, so that's as much as I can remember. Um, so we, we see the second question had to do with how do we cross the boundaries? Um, I, I feel that we have to find common ground. And I look at issues more as as from a moral perspective, and from a political perspective, which means thinking with more with the heart. So to bring people in, we need to find the common ground, and we can go we can go from there. I would say. Thank you, Barbara. Oh, and good. Mark, can you share from your group? Yes. Yep. So uh, uh, we had three, uh, three of the four of us uh, had business backgrounds. So uh, they were, uh, and that the fourth was me. I'm, uh, I'm not. Um, and so they were able to speak quite uh, eloquently to uh, the uh, differences between the groups. And I think the, the real opportunity here seems to be in Sort of, sort of your business conservatives as opposed to worrying too much about uh, those you know, progressives and your more mainstream Democrats because there's a, big, there's a big population of business conservatives out there that have a lot of pull in the political arena. And, and, and therefore, if you win them over, you sort of by implication can uh, garner uh, a, a, a great deal of support. And the difference between, uh, if you will, left and right, seems to be that the business conservatives are very data focused. They're, they're, it's uh, all about payroll. It's all about cost. It's complexity. It's their, their business is their world. You know, they, that's what 
gets them out of bed in the morning. It's what they think about when they're trying to fall asleep at night. And so arguments or, or, or narratives that speak to things like uh, social benefit and so on are going to not, it, it's, it's worse than falling on deaf ears. It may actually alienate them. And so you, you really need to kind of stick with a very quantitative, hard nose kind of approach, um, you know, and, and that's because that's what motivates them. And so I think that, that the how, how do you go about doing it? I'm not so sure uh, with, with, all res with all due respect, I'm not so sure the common ground argument is really what we where we need to look. I think what we need to do is as progressives, we need to be cognizant of where we stand relative to whom we're talking and then tailor the message to them. Don't try to sell your message, sell them on a message that will appeal to them. And the beautiful thing about universal health care is it's a win-win no matter how you slice it. I don't care why people endorse universal health care. So if they want to endorse it because it makes if you know it makes economic sense, great. I mean, even if that's not even if they're they're not looking for a social benefit, doesn't matter to me. Just get on board, and I think it's up to us to sort of be aware of you know who we're talking to, and tailor the message to them, and not try to work it the other way. Thanks. Thank you, Mark and Mary. Can you present your your teams? Yeah, well, I think we only got half as much time as everybody else because we didn't have enough time to talk about all that. So, <laughs> um, uh, but what uh, is it's kind of repeating what um, some have said uh, in trying to identify how the groups are different. The the really obvious and easy one is you know progressives um, are driven really more on uh, principle. So healthcare is a human right um, and looking at it from a, a, a justice issue, whereas businesses are gonna be practical. Um, how are we gonna pay for it? Um, how does it affect our business? Um, and uh, the, if those questions can be answered, um, they're all in because it, it's a huge benefit um, to them. Uh, it was, we, we, we struggled uh, a little bit with um, defining mainstream Democrats. That's, that's hard. Uh, uh, we, uh, it was also mentioned that um, COVID is changing. It may change some of these dynamics, but we weren't really sure how. Uh, and um, we didn't get to the question um, about the obstacles. I think it's an incredibly important one. What are the obstacles to building those coalitions? Um, but we did not get there. Thank you. So Warren, back to you. So uh, we finished that and I appreciated every, every, uh, um, every comment. I think one of the things that resonated with me as a business person is that uh, business people are of some necessity uh, kind of uh, heads down uh, data uh, data oriented uh, they're trying to keep their business going and uh, and that's what as you uh, said mark uh, gets them up in the morning and uh, keeps them up at uh, keeps them up at night so uh, now i'm going to talk just a few minutes about the changing about the uh, changing um, uh, face of business. Um, I live in a county, uh, happens to be a um, democratic county, uh, that uh, if we look at the top 10 employers in Benton County, Oregon, uh, Oregon State University, uh, Samaritan Health Services, uh, Hewlett Packard, there's a private company and Corvallis School District 509J, Corvallis Clinic, another medical company. Then we've got Benton County, then we've got City of Corvallis. And in fact, of this top 10 list, 90% uh, of these are medical or government. Only 10% are private business. 
And this is a group that uh, represents, uh, you know, close to half of all the uh, non-farm employment in Benton County. And uh, when you look at those, uh, the four private businesses on this list, um, their total employment has gone down by 50% in the last 10 years. Now, if we look at uh, Lynn County, a, a Republican County just across the border, um, just across the river, uh, we see uh, a few more uh, private companies. There's my old company, uh, ATI, uh, but you run into the same problem. Uh, it's uh, over half, the 65% of this top 10 list is government or medical. And in fact, my old company that did have 500 employees closed in December, along with uh, uh, paper mill closing in the last uh, uh, 15 years, uh, job, private jobs in this area are going down. And another thing that you see is it's uh, used to be able to find some business owners uh, that you could get a hold of and, and uh, lead the band, uh, kind of lead the community in, in some kind of reform. And that's get harder because many of these remaining private businesses are managed out of Pittsburgh, Texas, um, Denver, uh, uh, and it's, it's harder to find people to get a hold of. So now, Mike, if you could uh, set up this audience poll, uh, just think about uh, in total before the pandemic were private businesses in your area employing more or fewer workers than they did uh, 10 or 20 years ago. And in the two previous groups, um, about 60% uh, of the people said that private businesses are employing uh, fewer employees in uh, your area. Um, my next uh, uh, question uh, is, are the revenue plans in the Medicare for All bills, uh, the Jayapal bill, HR 1384, or the Sanders bill uh, 1129, uh, are those funding uh, revenue plans, are they pro-business or anti-business? And you can think about uh, how you would answer that. The previous two groups um, were about, uh, I think, uh, close to um, half of the people uh, said that those plans are pro-business uh, and half said they didn't know and just a few people uh, said that they're anti-business. So continuing on, uh, one of the most important aspects of building a coalition around universal care is uh, understanding the product, by which I mean uh, any proposed legislation, understanding how it will benefit or harm each of the potential coalition members. So what does business need to know about the product or the legislation uh, before they become a coalition member in universal care? Business people are worriers. Um, they can't stand uncertainty. Um, they need to know details. Uh, what will happen to my costs and my employees' costs? Uh, what will happen to my employees' quality of care? Um, so considering, uh, since that's important to business, uh, now let's look at the, uh, at the uh, two uh, Medicare for All bills and, and analyze uh, the funding details and whether it's pro-business uh, and whether it's uh, anti-business. So uh, here it is. Um, oh, uh, there actually is no funding plan for either one of these bills. Uh, and of the 19 states uh, which have considered a state bill, um, most have not uh, developed actual funding plans. I'll give uh, Colorado, Washington State, uh, main credit for having put some plans to paper, um, possibly Minnesota as well, uh, as soon as I learned about that one. Now, some people have quibbled about this. They say, oh, the funding plan is on Bernie's website. You just have to go read it. Well, why is it on Bernie's website and not in the bill? Um, other people say, oh, the details are widely known. They're on Gerald Friedman's website. 
or, oh, the details are widely known. They're on Robert Poland's uh, uh, Medicare for All analysis that he did in uh, 2018. And, and in fact, uh, that kind of helps my point here that uh, uh, while there's no funding in the actual bills and won't be until uh, somebody puts it there and then that's blessed by the Congressional Budget Office. Um, in the meantime, what business has to do uh, is um, uh, while they're waiting for some kind of information, uh, they're only seeing unofficial uh, information from different groups who've proposed different things. Uh, but some of those proposals that are out there, unofficial proposals for state or national care have business costs going up dramatically. Others have it about the same. Some have employer costs going down. So business is left to consider who's gonna win. Uh, there's a lot of fear and a lot of uncertainty in the mind of business people. Who's on their side? Uh, who is against them, they're having to make those decisions. So in the meantime, um, well, there are no actual, and, and the funding details, of course, are gonna be especially important to business. Um, what can you do when you don't have the details to tell these people who wanna know details? Um, so I have uh, four suggestions here. Uh, admit that the details aren't ready. Don't tell them things that you can't back up. Uh, explain the theory of universal care. Offer to keep them informed of any details as they become available. Um, build a relationship by listening. And here's one of the most important things, I think, is to actually promise to fight for their interests, to make sure that they're not uh, undo unduly thrown uh, under the bus. Uh, on this. So, uh, you know, build a relationship, listen to them. And, um, you know, if you do uh, want to build a coalition with them, um, promise to be supportive of, of their interests. If you're not in favor of their interests, then don't try to make them a, a coalition uh, partner. So here's just a couple of other uh, observations. Uh, business owners and self-employed are even more dissatisfied than others, but they're somewhat uncertain what to do about it. Mostly they're too busy, too busy uh, to give it a lot of thought. Um, they're also uh, reluctant to join universal care advocacy groups uh, for a variety of reasons that uh, you can uh, that you can guess. Um, so uh, here is my. Uh, for kind of final uh, recommendations for you to think about from a standpoint of a business person. Uh, the first one is uh, clarity of message. Um, if you're going to agree on something, uh, you have to actually know what it is that you're uh, going to agree on. Is universal care about the collective benefits of universality? or is it about lobbying for economic transfers? Uh, so consider these two different messages, um, uh, which are somewhat conflicting, but I hear them both often in uh, advocacy meetings. Uh, one is the efficiency of universality. Um, let's call it the statement. I want everybody to save money on healthcare with most of the savings going to pay for better care for people who aren't currently covered. And I think that's, that's going to be a statement that um, business uh, and lots of people uh, can agree to. Uh, the second statement, uh, I want the cost transferred onto someone else. Uh, well, that's harder. Some, some of those transfers might make sense uh, and might uh, uh, everybody be for them and up to some, uh, up to some limited value or um, but for every one of these transfers that you put in there, uh, you're going to uh, collect some amount of people who are, uh, who are now going to oppose uh, what you wanted to achieve in statement one. Singularity of message is particularly important when you're dealing with, with groups that have different motivations and different mentalities. Uh, mentalities, there's no limit 
uh, other than universal, the one thing of universal care, there's no limit to the other things you won't agree on. Uh, so, you know, the joke of wearing a t-shirt with universal care on the front and gun control on the back um, is going to, it's not going to play well in all, in all circles that, that would accept universal care. So the practicality of the message is very important. Um, you know, get the details ready. Um, a lot of people are waiting on them and where there's you know, multiple competing plans, um, you know, states can come up with their own, but at the national level, as long as you have uh, eight or 10 different versions uh, of the funding plan out there, uh, you don't have any kind of agreement. So figure out how to agree on those principles and make it easier for business people uh, to, uh, to decide uh, whether they can tolerate that or not. And uh, inclusivity of message uh, is also important. Uh, make it about working together as partners and try to avoid messages uh, that are about uh, uh, us versus them. And, uh, you know, would go a lot smoother if everybody who uh, once universal care figures out ways to reassure each other uh, that they'll try to figure out how to do this transition uh, with everybody, uh, with everybody uh, um, staying upright and their feet on the ground. I'll end with this uh, one uh, fairly obvious statement about funding, which is uh, the only fair tax is one paid by people you don't directly know. Uh, don't know personally and probably wouldn't like anyway. So now we'll have open discussion and uh, uh, questions as you uh, as you want. Uh, Betty, it's uh, yours to run. Thank you, Warren. Thank you so much.